Okay. Oh, that was loud. <laughs> I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, well, we're going to talk about um, um, responsible sponsorship. And um, to be a responsible sponsor, you first have to stop sponsoring. I mean, this is the essence of the program. This is what the program is all about. That's why I've had the spiritual experience so that I can carry this message to the next suffering alcoholic. I mean, the 12th step is a part of the 12 steps. It's nothing that is separate. This is a part of the 12 step program and it's the essence of the program. And I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't uh, start sponsoring people very early or try to carry the message. Uh, and um, I just want to read something, if I can find it. It's uh, in the, uh, the doctor's... What page is that on, Peter? In the back of the book. Oh, I found it now. Uh, Dr. W. W. Bauer, broadcasting under the auspices of the American Medical Association in 1946 over the MBS network, said in part, Alcoholics Anonymous are no crusaders, not a temperance society. They know that they must never drink. They help others with similar problems. And in this atmosphere, the alcoholic often overcomes his excessive concentration upon himself. <coughs> Learning to depend upon a higher power and absorb himself in his work with other alcoholics, he remains sober day by day. The, the days add up into weeks, the weeks into months and years. And I think that's a, a, an excellent prescription of an alcoholic like me, very, very selfish and very, very self-centered. And this is an altruistic movement where I have to go out and try to help and be helpful to other people and help other alcoholics so that I can, God can work in me through this work that I do. And I mean, when Bill had his spiritual experience at the hospital, he had, a, he had a grand, vital spiritual experience. It was like, like this, you know? And the first thing he thought about was not, oh, now I'm okay, I'm going to go back and get, my, get a job, now I'm going to get my family together. The first thing he thought about was, how can I give this away to another alcoholic? You know, that was the first thing that crossed his mind. And when he was in Akron and the, the failed uh, business uh, thing he'd been at, he didn't, when he was nearly, when he heard all the drinking in the bar and his mind started to tell him that, well, maybe I could take a few drinks. He had, he was restored to sanity and therefore he could recognize those, the thinking that came. And he knew that he was on, on his way to drink again, if he didn't talk to another alcoholic. He didn't phone his sponsor. He tried to get hold of another drunk because he knew that is what's going to save me, you know? And I mean, this is the essence of the program, one alcoholic to another, and give the information about the first step, about the, the, um, the illness, the hopelessness of this illness, because Dr. Bob, he knew the, the solution, he was dragged to the Oxford uh, movement by his wife and he knew the solution and he read a lot of spiritual stuff but he didn't know what he was suffering from. He still drank. 
until Bill came along and told him what he had learned from Dr. Silkworth about the hopelessness of, of uh, the mind and the body. Then, when he understood that he was doomed to drink again, then he got willing to do the work. I mean, he didn't really do the work before. He didn't want to follow it through. And, um, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if Abby hadn't gone to Bill Wilson. And I just want to tell you about another man in Sweden. His, his name was Lars V. He went to meetings, he was a real alcoholic, he went to meetings, he went out and drank over and over again, and he couldn't understand what was wrong with him. And he asked them, what, what do I do? Go to more meetings, speak out, speak out, they said to him. And he went to more meetings and he spoke about his problems and how he felt and, you know, he went out drinking again and again and again. And one day, on the shelf, on the bookshelf, shelf, he found the big book and he started to look at it. In Sweden, this was. And he said, could I borrow this book home? Oh, yes, take it. We don't use it. <laughs> so he took it home, he started to read this book like I did when I was in my last treatment. And he started to, because he started to follow the directions in this book, because he understood that this is the solution. Here is the solution. And he followed the directions on his own. And he had a spiritual experience and he recovered from the obsession to drink. And he went over to America and he came across, he went to Joe McQuinney. And Joe McQuinney was a guy in Arkansas, in, uh, in America. <laughs> and he uh, took him through the steps from the book. And this guy, Lars, he learned all about the AA history. He was so fascinated with this. And he went back to Sweden because he told him, you go back to Sweden, you carry this message. And he carried this message. He made the big book alive again in Sweden. And that's all he did for the rest of his life until he died. And he was very sick in the end because he was a real alcoholic. And he sponsored the guy that had the seminar that I went to, that went through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous so that I could understand them. And when I realized uh, this is what I have to do if I want to survive. And this is how God works, you know. I wouldn't be sitting here otherwise. And that's what we are doing. We don't know the results of what we do. We just do it. And that's exactly a responsible sponsorship when I, when I get someone to help and I take them through this process and they have a spiritual experience and they recover from the mental obsession, go out and help the next one. Go and carry this message. But I have so much trouble at home and I feel so bad. I know. Go and help somebody. That will take you out of yourself. And for the first time, you will start to feel that when you give, you will feel like there is a meaning in your life. And like it says, and you will, you will, when you come home, the problems are not that big anymore. Because you just talk to, a, to an alcoholic who is nearly dying, just like you were. And then it doesn't matter that the wife has spent too much money on a hat. I mean, that's how it works. That's how it worked for me in the very, very beginning. I, I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know much. But I had the book. And I had the willingness. 
And that's what saved me in the beginning. And I remember I found my daughter and I, I nearly cried and I said, I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, <laughs> you know? And I was sitting with some other people, uh, taking someone through a fifth step and it was just, <gasps> wow! And, you, you know, it says the, me, the life will on take on a new meaning and it talks to you. You can help when no one else can. You can. You. You. It's talking to me. Because the language changed from we to you in the chapter of working with others. And I don't have to know the result of what I'm doing. That's in God's hands. I just do it. And it's helping me maybe more than the person I try to help. Because that's what gets me out of myself. And if I don't do that, life won't take on a new me. It's as simple as that. I know why I'm here today. I know why I'm... I, this grace. I haven't got it for free. To, to, to have a good life, to be, go around and be spiritual. It's not for me. I've got this grace because God's got work for me. God doesn't want me to thank you for having my job back, thank you for this and this. God wants to see me in action. And I know that I have to do that if I want permanent sobriety. And that's why I'm sitting here. I'm no expert. I don't know how to do this. I'm scared to death sometimes. But I never, I, I, I never, I know this is what I have to do. And I know that if I said, no, I don't want to because I'm, I'm not feeling for it or, or something. You know, every decision based on fear will take me to more fear and guilt or whatever it is, you know. Every fear-based decision leads to more fear. This is how I grow in effectiveness and understanding, you know. I grow by sitting here. I, I challenge my fears because I don't trust in me anymore. I trust in God. And I mean, how selfish of me not to carry this message to another dying alcoholic if I have a solution to offer. Sometimes at detox I say like, because I go to detox and I carry this message and I love it. And sometimes I say, if, if you were a crowd of patients who had cancer and you know you're dying and you get some relief of talking to each other about, you know, you have the same problem. You get some comfort in that. Oh, we have the same problem and like, you know. And I come in there and I say to you, you know, I've had the same deadly cancer as you. And I'm well today. I'm well today. Don't you think they would run to me and ask me, tell me what you've done. <laughs> Give us the medicine. But not the alcoholic. <laughs> because the alcoholic says, you know, they go to the doctor and the doctor say, I have a recipe for you. And the, and the alcoholic says, but I, if, if, you, if the doctor says to you, you have cancer in your stomach, okay, and you, it's growing, and you're going to die from it, yeah? And you have to be in, we have to start a, a surgery tomorrow. You'll be here at uh, 730 Every normal person would be there 7.30, let me in, let me in, do with me, whatever. I don't want to die. 
But an alcoholic says, but I feel quite good today. And I met a new boyfriend. And the doctor says, well, what has that got to do with your cancer in your stomach? But we are buying a new house. <coughs> That's me. That's us. Because we cannot see the truth. It's the only disease who tells me I don't have it. You know? And that's why it's so funny to go to detox as well. It's not, it's not funny, but I love it to go there. And they come over and over again. And every time they have a new plan. This time, oh, um, it's not going to be like last time. This time I'm going to do like this and that and it's going to be okay. Okay? And I've been telling them about this deadly disease. <laughs> but this time, and I go there, you know, uh, a week later and they're back again. Oh, what happened? <laughs> well, you know, all kinds of excuses. But I mean, this is the secret handshake in AA. This is what the program is all about. I take the steps, I recover, and I carry this to the next one. This is what AA is. And like Audrey read, and I love that, that in Bill's story, you know what Abby had emphasized. That we have to do this. Because we are so self-centered that if we don't give away what we have been given, we go back into self and self-centeredness and all is about me again, you know. And I will eventually drink. Because I'm not like other people. Like it says in, in the, this chapter. <laughs> it must be crushed. You know, I'm not like other people. I have a different way of thinking, different way of feeling, and I need to get out and help someone else. And how selfish of me not to do that. And the one I sponsor, go and help the next one. And the next one, go and help the next one. And suddenly we are a few people and we can start a group. <laughs> a good group. With a solution. Solution based. But it's, it's also, you know... Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message, not my message, not, not some other message, not what I think, this message. There is only one suggestion in this book and it's very exact and precise to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all my affairs. And I mean, there are wonderful chapters in this book that I never read in the beginning. And it's two wives, it's two employers, it's the family afterwards. You know, and they are wonderful chapters. And they have a lot of information. And I also love the story of uh, the third member, um, Bill Dodson. And uh, if you get a chance, please read it. It was about how Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob visited him at the hospital. They didn't sit and wait for him to come to them. They went there. And they had um, beautiful questions to ask him. <laughs> And then they left. And then they came back. You know? But to practice these principles in all my affairs is very, very important. And I mean, it will take time uh, with the family. They have lived with a sick person like me 
for many, many years, and I have made them sick. And when I realized that, you know, it was, I started to understand how, how much pain I've caused them. And it will take time for the trust to come back. But I demonstrate that today. I, in the beginning I, I talked about this spiritual stuff all the time, all the time. And they got so tired of me, you know. Oh, they listened because they were so happy I was sober. But I mean, today I don't do that. I, I demonstrate through who I am today, you know, so that they can stop to trust me again. It takes time with the family. But I mean, whatever problems I have at home or at work, all that is solved when I go out and help another alcoholic. Because suddenly, there is no problem. There is no problem anymore, you know? And responsible sponsorship, you have to start sponsoring. That's a part of this program. And that's what they say, said to uh, Bill Dodson. Uh, a part of this program is, I, I think they said it even more, you, that we go out and help the next one. That's what this is about, you know. But I have a very good thing here from um, Chris Ramers. Uh, how do I do this? Slide. <coughs> that we have sent to us, and, and I, I think this is so good. You all know Chris, don't you? And um, this is sort of responsible sponsorship, I think. And uh, he's uh, made a document. And, uh, you know, like Audrey said, you hear all the time, are you willing to go to any length? Are you willing to go to any length? And I had no clue what that was until uh, they showed me, this is what, what you have to do. I thought, oh, I go to Denmark <laughs> tomorrow if she asks me, you know. Um, and he's been writing like this, willing to go to any length. One. Are you willing to be qualified? Some people get very offended to, uh, if I start to ask them, well, uh, we have to find out if you're one of us. You know? Because if you're not one of us, you don't need to do this. This is the, the, the last... Stop on the block. Stop on the block. No. no. House on the block. <laughs> I think it is. So you, know. you know, if you don't need to, if you don't have this disease, you don't need to do this. Or if you have some other problem, you, you should go somewhere else. Maybe I can help you with that. This is not something I, I chose when I was a child. I want to go to AA. I want to be an alcoholic and go to AA and spend the rest of my life there. You know, if you don't have this disease, fine, cool, but we have to find out. And we do that by page 20, 21 and 44. And that is, you know, uh, the moderate drinker, the hard drinker or the real alcoholic. Is this you? Is this you? Is this you? And the, the two questions on page 44. If when you honestly want to, you cannot leave it alone, you know, you can't stop for good and for all. And when you drink, if you lose uh, control over the amount you take, the allergy. And, you know, we qualify them. They did that in the old days. Always. And then they asked ask them, you know, if you want what we have. Welcome. We're going to show you what we did. He writes that some folks get here by mistake. I mean, I know, I, I've been in 
three treatment centers, and I know people who, who came to treatment centers because they've been uh, drunk driving. And they, some, the social security or something said, oh, you better go to a treatment center. And, the treatment, and they go there, and the treatment center says, you have a problem with alcohol, you better go to AA. And they are not real alcoholics. And these people, they can stay sober on meetings. And that's okay. They love the meetings. They love to go there and drink coffee and listen to stories and wow, nice women and good coffee and, you know? And they can stay sober on that. But not a real alcohol like me. I tried. I didn't succeed. And the second thing is, are you willing to take the steps quickly? Because as, as it says, we have maybe a week or a month. As it says on, on page 24. See? I can do something. I will read it to you. But I love it. This is the truth. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Do you think Bill meant that? Our so-called willpower becomes pra practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times, and I don't know when that certain time is going to be, to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force, I mean, sometimes maybe I can, but sometimes I can't. Suddenly, you know, the thought comes, and I don't know when. The memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. So it says we have a week or a month. If we haven't got a spiritual solution. And working the steps as a way of life. And he writes, yes, it is a race. And this is why it's a race. Three, are you willing to attend specific meetings early on? Literature-based meetings. Where you study and learn the big book and the solution. Are you willing to focus on only the big book until the steps are done? Are you willing to be completely honest about sex, checks, money, medications? Because you know it's about honesty. If I can't be honest with myself and others, I won't make it. Are you willing to be open-minded about anonymity? It's okay to tell folks that you're in recovery. Are you willing to take a service commitment now and that, that's in the group? Do something, you know, make the coffee, take a commitment, be a, a greeter at the door as they have, you know, greet the newcomer when he comes, make them feel welcome. Anything. Pick up the cigarette butts. You don't have to be the chairman at once. <laughs> Eight. Are you willing to be accountable in all three parts of AA recovery? Of AA. Recovery, unity and service. And that's the circle and triangle. 
that we have to be in all these three parts to be recovered, you know. We have to be in the meetings to serve, try and help the newcomers who come there and give this message away. Unity. We have to take the steps, be in the, live the steps, and we have to help others. We have to be in all three parts of this circle and triangle to be in AA. It's as simple as that. Are you willing to learn the traditions? And it's very important and I was and I still am too bad at the, the traditions and I was like, oh, oh, the traditions and not much fun. It's not about me, is it? <laughs> no. But it's very important that I, as a sponsor, can give away the tradition, to learn them the traditions. Because the, it, without traditions, AA will die. That's why Bill wrote them. Because it was of experience. He, he started to see all the egos and, and how it started to fall apart, you know. And he understood, I, we have to have some guidelines for the groups or, the, or, the, or they will die from inside with all these alcoholics inside there, with all their opinions. So, and I mean, he went around everywhere to talk about the traditions and nobody wanted to listen to him. But he didn't give up and uh, they were, you know, approved. I don't know what year, 1940? 46? 46, yeah. 52. 52? Okay. But this is very important. to my historian. Hmm? said, I defer to my historian. Yes. And here comes, uh, I think, quite important one. Are you willing to follow guidance about meeting etiquette? You know, how do you behave in a meeting? You know, no mobile phones. Don't get up in the middle of a meeting to go, uh, or in the middle of a share, you know to go smoke or to the toilet or uh, running around. We have to, I mean, they do what I do. If I sit in a meeting and I eat at the same time, well, my sponsors or the people I try to have, they think that's okay to do that in an AM meeting. Come early, leave late. Peter had a good thing there, his sponsor said, if you're uh, half an hour early, you're too late. <laughs> Be there in time. You can talk to the people before the meeting and after the meeting. How do we behave at meetings, you know? Because, I mean, we're so selfish and self-centered, it's all about me all the time. I mean, we are undisciplined people. I was, you know. We have to learn about meeting etiquette. Are you willing to look at your health and your exercise? How is it with your health? You know? Are you going out for walks? Are you doing anything? Or just laying in your sofa eating goodies? You know? How is it? Are you willing to keep appointments and schedules set for the step work? I mean, I give my time, we give each other respect, you keep the times. Because I set time for you and then you keep the times. Because you are the one who asks for help. <laughs> I mean, I don't want what you have. If you want what I have, you better keep the times. I remember my first uh, sponsor, I was uh, five minutes late once. 
and I was terrified. I was like, whoa, better get on the I'm here. And, and she just said, okay. I was going to wait two minutes more and then I would hang up. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I do. I needed that. No? And then lastly, he says, I won't chase you and I won't give you advice about your life. I'm not a therapist. I can't help you with your personal problems, you know. Or tell you, oh, I think you should leave him, get another one. You know, that's not up to me. Not at all. Because I only have one pair of shoes to give you. And that's the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, a program for recovery that has worked for me and so many others. And if you want another pair of shoes, try them first. This is all I have. And it's up to you to walk in them. And I think this is just great stuff. <laughs> great stuff. And I mean, Audrey talked a lot about uh, how to approach an alcoholic the first time and how to talk to them. And uh, you can read in the book uh, Bill, <coughs> Bill Dodson as well. It's, it's, um, I love that story. And, but the most important thing is to understand what AA is about. It's about giving it away to be able to keep it. I won't keep it if I don't give it away. And only God can turn a mess into a message. <laughs> I love that too. You know? <clears throat> everything that I was so ashamed of and all the stuff I've done, everything turns into my experience and I can give it to someone else. Because I'm not ashamed of my past anymore, you know? The best thing that happened to me was that I became an alcoholic, because otherwise I would never have this way of life, you know? I would be dead, but I mean, <laughs> I would never, I, I was never able to live in three dimensions of life. To live life on life terms, that's what I could not do. I have tried. For me, as an alcoholic, I had to get into the fourth dimension, the spiritual dimension of life, because that's what I sought in the bottle. Mm -hmm. Always. And it worked in the beginning, and then it didn't work anymore. And I couldn't live without it. And this is a new way of life that gives me that same feeling that I had. You know, I have a new solution today and it's got to be better than the one I had when alcohol was working for me. And it is. And I have it without alcohol because of these 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am so truly very, very grateful. And I'm so grateful to be here tonight. You know, I am just stunned that I'm sitting here and can do this. And it's not me, like Audrey said. I can't do this, you know. Instead, we let God demonstrate through us what he can do. And that is just amazing. Magic. And as I said before, I'm not a miracle. The miracle is this program, these 12 steps. Newborn. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and I thank you all so very much.
I'm Henrik and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you so much, my friend. I think I speak <coughs> for everybody when I say we are so grateful that you are here. Thank you.